Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. Oregon's short legislative session is getting underway, and even though it's just a few weeks long, there are some big things on the table. Lawmakers will consider weakening a major piece of Measure 110. That's the state's controversial voter-approved drug decriminalization law. And the governor is introducing a very large housing bill, asking for something like half a billion dollars. So today on CityCast Portland, OPB state politics and government reporter Dirk Vanderhart is here to give us a preview of what's to come. It's Monday, January 29th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Has anyone ever been like, Dirk, da Dirk, Dirk, Dirk? Like from the thong song? Yeah. I like to think they have, but not that I know. Maybe like to themselves. Whenever I think about you, Dirk, that's how I hear your name in my head. I love that. That's nice. I just wanted you to know. Could you quickly explain what a short session is to those who, like me, uh, barely understand what a regular session is? Yeah. used to be every other year we would have a six-month session that was for passing laws and setting a two-year budget and all sorts of things. And the idea came that we should probably have a shorter session, a 35-day session, in even-numbered years because emergencies come up. Maybe there's some budget tweaks that need to be made. And rather than calling those special sessions that need to come up, we can just plan on coming in for a month and do the work there. So every year there's a session, basically. Every Yeah, we have a session every year. Thankfully, it is a short. The short years are better, man. Six months is... It's a long time. uh, I'm there a lot, yeah. I'm I'm also (laughs) living on I-5 a lot. Well, the big item most people are anticipating in this session is changes to 110. A number of ideas have been discussed, but do we know what the plan is yet? So we haven't seen the official plan, but I I would say that we do have the broad strokes of what we're expecting. And it's actually pretty surprising. Measure 110, really since it passed, has been a lightning rod in Salem. Republicans have almost continuously called for it to be repealed or weakened in some way, shape, or form. Now we are expecting Democrats to do something surprising, which is bring forward a proposal that would actually recriminalize uh, small-time possession of drugs. So people remember Measure 110 decriminalized that. We were the first state mm-hmm. in the nation to make it so if you have a small amount of heroin or meth or or what have you, you were not going to be subject to arrest and prosecution. You could be given a ticket. But Democrats are are now acknowledging that the way things are working on the streets probably needs a little more muscular of a tool, I think they would say. And so we we expect them to bring forth a proposal that would make it a a misdemeanor, very low-level misdemeanor, to possess illicit drugs. That's going to be coupled, I'm I'm sure, with things that will help steer people toward treatment, you know, bolster the treatment services around the state. Because I think there really is also an acknowledgement that arrest is not the answer. Clearly, arrest is not the answer. I do think Democrats have come to the conclusion that police maybe aren't wrong when they say there needs to be something additional if we're going to have some sort of tool to stop people smoking fentanyl on the streets. You know, there's a lot of people overdosing in public. I mean, there's just a lot of really dramatic and and kind of saddening stuff playing out. So I I think that's kind of what we're expecting to see. Yeah. You know, you just, you, you said two things and I'm curious what the impact, you know, could be. One, somehow magically we're going to have enough room for all of these low level arrests, Mm. you know, two, we don't even have the resources, you know, now for people who have, um, addiction issues to go to. I feel like a lot of people were saying, well, that's the big reason is we never had the second part. You know, I mean, Measure 110 was supposed to be a one-two punch and we just had one Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the two never came, meaning we didn't have the resources to actually help people who were suffering through addiction. Um, So if we started to make it illegal, like, what do you think that impact would be? Yeah, and you are articulating a a question and an argument that the folks that very much are against this um, are are raising. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just 
that our court systems are often overburdened. We have a public defender crisis where already we're seeing cases being thrown out of court because people don't have attorneys, as is constitutionally guaranteed. So I think there are some big questions there. What I would say, Claudia, is the needle they're trying to thread here is to create as many outs for a person that comes upon police officers in a way that could lead to criminal charges as possible. So, you know, I think the proposal we see will mandate that if I am a police officer and I encounter someone smoking fentanyl, for instance, before I can arrest and charge them, I need to offer them the opportunity to meet with a behavioral health provider and maybe have an interview and maybe get the cycle started that could connect them to any number of resources um, that might bring about a change in their addiction. That is a pretty pie in the sky way of thinking about it. I think it makes a lot of sense, but you're right. Like, I don't know where the money comes from to get us to the place where those resources are just abundant to what we need. And that feels like something that is going to be a process as well. Yeah. Are advocates cool with this? I'm imagining they might be mad. You know, advocates for Measure 110, I mean, like, what are they saying? Aside from, like, these two questions that I'm asking. No, they are very know? much not cool with this. I mean, in fact, you know, like, a, a lot of people um, on both sides of the, the drug policy debate actually were pretty surprised to, to hear that Democrats were considering this. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, their arguments are the ones you expect, right? Like, jailing people and arresting your way out of the drug war has never worked. The drug war failed. It had you know, consequences for communities of color that were disproportionate. It had all sorts of dramatic impacts. If you are rolled up in the criminal justice system, it might be harder to find housing or secure a job, and that's unlikely to help you get out of your addiction. I mean, there are a lot of arguments that are made, and and I think the advocates are are really preaching a stay-the-course mentality, which is like, look, we are still working to get this up and running. There is good work happening. We need to be focused on that as opposed to um, getting distracted by some of the stuff that lawmakers are are finding really concerning. And, you know, I I think at least the Democrats agree with a lot of that, but but also Mm -hmm. have come to the conclusion that law enforcement does need the ability to, for instance, just stop people amassing on a street. Yeah, I mean, whatever, like (laughs) amassing on a street corner in Portland, just huffing fentanyl and like passing out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, you said something that I just want to make sure is heard is that the Democrats are asking themselves like, well, we need to create one more tool. And it's just so sad that they're like, well, what is the problem? Let's find the tool. They're still just like hammer, <laughs> you know, like, like, I just feel like whenever we're thinking of, of things that we're trying to discourage people from doing, it's always just they're a nail and we need a hammer. You know, and it's just like always jail, jail, jail. I would, I mean, they they would absolutely take issue with that characterization because I think they are going to try to roll out a policy that that has a, a bias toward getting people in front of behavioral health providers. What behavioral health providers, I guess, is what I'm asking, you know? Right. Yeah. And it is true that you're right, though. Like the way that this works in theory, there has to be a backstop, right? And that backstop is mm-hmm. jail. I do agree that something else needs to happen. I'm just always disappointed that it's always the thing. Oh, let's go back to the thing that didn't work before. So what's the likelihood that it will pass? I mean, we are early, early days. Like, I mean, here's the really interesting thing about this, though. And I'm glad you asked this because it's a question I have. We have Republicans who have a hardline version of this bill, basically a let's repeal Measure 110. They would argue they have a plan for sort of making sure that people are steered toward treatment as opposed to prosecuted. But but it's it's definitely a harder line plan, right? And probably one that doesn't have much legs in this legislature. But now we have Democrats uh, saying, some Democrats at least saying, a Class C misdemeanor is the way forward. Not all Democrats. And so my question is going to be, like, what does the coalition look like on this? Are there enough Democrats that that oppose this for some of the reasons you've articulated that they would potentially stand in the way of a bill passing? And on the other mm-hmm. side, are Republicans so angry that it's not a, a harder hammer that they won't support it? And so maybe like this attempt to sort of split the baby is just unsuccessful. I kind of doubt it, um, but, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think everyone acknowledges that something needs to happen. The politics here could get really, really interesting. And, and if something doesn't pass, like, there's a real possibility that voters have the opportunity to do this on their own because there are, are some deep pockets that are potentially backing a ballot measure for November that would do a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, this came about through a ballot measure. Right. And we, the people seem to be 
not the best at making law sometimes. This, I sometimes. mean, just to clarify, like <laughs> this horse was before the cart happens a bit. Not necessarily, definitely horse before the cart. Not necessarily like a, a citizen driven thing. You know, Measure One Ten was really the brainchild and kind of an experiment by the Drug Policy Alliance, which is a national organization based in New York City, and saw an opportunity because. <laughs> Oregon voters tend to be really liberal and kind of like the ideas that are put before them and maybe say yes to a lot of things to, in 2020, put this forward. And Mm -hmm. people bit. And, you know, then a a pandemic was going on. And I don't need to recount all this stuff, but things are worse, obviously, in Oregon in a lot of ways in terms of the drug crisis than they were in 2020. That is also the case for the entire West Coast and probably the entire country. All right, well, let's take a quick break here. And when we return, we'll get into Governor Kotek's proposed housing bill. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right. New music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. We just talked about Measure 110. That's one of the bills that will be introduced in this short session. Governor Kotex says she's only going to ask for one bill to be introduced, and it's on housing, but it's a big one. Like, what is she hoping for? Yeah, I mean, the governor has spent, you know, her entire first uh, year in office really focusing on housing and and a couple other things, but really, really housing. And that is going to continue this session. This is um, what she is terming a housing production bill. Basically, you know, people know we have a housing shortage here Um, We haven't been building enough housing for a long time to meet up with demand, and now we are seeing the fallout from that, which includes rising homelessness. So Kotec has set some really ambitious goals for how many housing units the state should be producing every year. Maybe unreachable goals, but she's trying to get there, and, you know, she wants $500 million to do a variety of things for spurring housing. $500 million, you know, in an even year when they're setting up a whole new budget is maybe not the most insane ass, though obviously a lot of money. In a short session like we're facing, which is really about budget tweaks, and often there's not a ton Mm -hmm. of money to go around, that is a very big ask. And so we will be interested to see if lawmakers kind of slap her hand or or go along with it. Maybe she can muscle it through. I think the thing that is going to get so much attention, though, on this is the governor has brought back a concept that she first floated – last year's session that was unsuccessful. Um, And it was unsuccessful because she couldn't bring a lot of Democrats or or enough Democrats with her on this. The concept here is that in order to spur more housing, the state should let cities sort of expand these urban growth boundaries that ring all of our cities, right? There is Mm -hmm. is an imaginary line that says you can build here, but if you cross it, you can't build there because we want to save farms and we want to save forests and we don't want to turn into... Claudia's home state of California. So I was about to say, are you gonna just are you gonna shit on me? Yeah, you are. There we are. What Kotak wants to do is give cities permission <laughs> to bring more land into these urban growth boundaries by themselves. Usually there's a, a pretty long, pretty involved process to sort of get land in this, in these growth boundaries to build. She's saying on a one-time basis, should cities should be able to just bring in a parcel of land that they want and start building housing mm-hmm. on it. As long as they do a couple things, they need to you know, prove that they need the housing. They need to make a certain number of it, amount of it affordable to folks. And I don't know, there's a couple other hurdles, but, but the point is that that is a pretty controversial ask in this state where we love our land use laws, right? Where we're so yeah. proud of, I mean, a certain segment of us are so proud that we have curbed urban sprawl like this and that we have sort of preserved the farms and forests that people love of the state. And so Democrats who really backed these land use laws were pretty skeptical last session. And and in a pretty dramatic vote at the last day of last year's session, 
co-tax bill failed in the Senate. And so she has brought it back. I think she's very bullish that it's going to pass this time. I think she has a reason to be. Uh, I, I believe it probably will pass this time. Yeah. But can I just give you the like a fun fact that I always find interesting? It just shows the development of where the Republican Party is now is that all these land use laws that Democrats love and hold dear to their heart was created by a governor, a Republican governor, mm -hmm. which is Tom McCall. And I always, I mean, I always just think that's funny. I mean, McCall, <laughs> so, he's got a lot of bangers to his name, like the bottle bill that people love. Oh my God, nonstop hits. This was uh, like such a far sunnier time in our national discourse where Republicans and Democrats could like actually talk about policy without falling back on all sorts of crazy, like, go to your corner and spout the most extreme stuff. That is certainly not the case in Salem all the time. I don't, but but obviously the polarization of politics has been pretty dispiriting in a lot of ways around the country. Yeah. Well, just curious, like, what are Republicans saying about these bills? You know, I mean, immediately I just want to know what they're saying about this this housing bill. Oh, they love it. I mean, the, the reason why I think that, um, I don't know that they love the whole bill, but th this whole thing about UGBs is a big hit with them. They are, they have long been more the party of deregulation. Let's cut this red tape and let houses be built and not just sort of stand mm -hmm. in people's way. The reason why I'm, I'm pretty confident that Kotex bill is passing this time is because even last year when it failed, that was kind of a fluke. Um, she called it up in the, or it got called up on the last day of session. You will remember, I think, Claudia, that Republicans had walked away and they had come oh, back by the last day of session, but some of them hadn't. They were still mad and they were still sticking away. And so if even one Republican that was staying away from the Capitol had been present on the last day of session, it is very, very likely that Kotex bill would have passed. I don't know this, but I would assume that more Republicans will be around this time. Kotex probably bring in a few more votes from the D side and, and that it's going to pass. So I, I think the Republicans are fans of this. Yeah. Weren't we supposed to kick a bunch of Republicans out? Because of their walkouts last year? Are they just coming back? Yeah, so <laughs> this is a... <laughs> what this, happened? <laughs> this is a very fraught thing. I mean, they they would have never been kicked out already. So, so what you're talking about is Measure 113, which was passed mm -hmm. in 2022. And it said that if any lawmaker has 10 or more unexcused absences in the session, they cannot run for re-election. So... 10 lawmakers triggered that. That means 10 lawmakers theoretically can't run for re-election. But remember, we haven't had an election yet. So mm -hmm. they would still be around anyway. Now, there's far more nuance to that and uncertainty in this whole thing than that because there is, there's a court case before the Oregon Supreme Court now that makes a pretty good case that the people that wrote that ballot measure kind of screwed up and that a drafting error could maybe mean that actually they're not, the Republicans aren't blocked from running for re-election this time. They get to run for re-election one more time, and then they're blocked oh. from running for re-election. And we could what? parse those words. It's it's crazy and kind of crazy making, but that is a question that we are waiting on the answer to. And the Oregon Supreme Court is going to make that declaration any day, I would think. Huh. I wonder who did that. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, I want a finger pointed. I'm like, which intern? <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm I'm also curious just about the mechanics of a short session. Like, are the bills always just introduced before it starts, or are there ever like surprise bills? You know, I think there's always the opportunity for a surprise uh, with any session. Yeah, the bills are largely introduced before it starts. We'll see bills early. You know, this thing convenes on February 5th. I think early February we'll see posted to the legislature's website all the bills um, that have been proposed. Mm -hmm. Now. The thing I love about the short session, besides it just being 35 days, is that lawmakers are limited in how many bills they can introduce. Very, mm. very helpful for someone trying to track the process because it's insane to try to keep tabs on thousands of bills. There can always be surprises. Here's what I would say, though. I don't expect a lot of surprises. And the reason I don't mm. is partly because of the walkout we just talked about. I mean, there are 10 Republicans now who have nothing to lose if they want to if they want to walk out, right? And they have sick. I mean, they've been saying that very vocally. Like, the, the Senate Republican leader, Tim Canope, has been saying, whenever you ask him about the session, well, if we have a session, you know, he's holding oh it out there God. like they might not show what up. Did, I'm sorry. That's so annoying. <laughs> so annoying. I, but I, and I don't think that's real. But what he's getting at is like, they don't have any reason not to walk. Like, th there's nothing more that anyone can do yeah. to them if they want to walk away. And I think Democrats are keenly aware of that. And, and as a result, they are not expected to bring any, you know, bring a big abortion bill, right? Or a big gun control oh, gotcha. bill or, or a big climate change bill or any of the things that in the past have sent Republicans to the door. Okay, so 
you said that, you know, in, in February before the session starts that all the bills will be posted on the website. Mm -hmm. But do we know, and you've only spoken about like two major bills, which is Measure 110 and the uh, housing bill that Governor Kotek is going to introduce. Do you have a favorite one that's coming up? Like anything that you're just like looking forward to, like just to hear the debate about? I don't. I mean, there's like a couple things we're tracking. Like I think the legislature is going to have a debate about should we find a new way to fund wildfire prevention? And and mm. like we don't have a sustainable way to pay for fighting fires or, or helping people prevent them. That's going to be a big thing. Not the sexiest discussion. Obviously very important. But no, like frankly right now I don't have – I don't have anything fun for you. I wish I did. There I mean, will be yeah. fun bills and there'll be really stupid bills, tons of stupid bills that we can talk about at some point, but I don't have the full picture yet. No one's no one's given me the cool stupid bill list to look forward yeah. to. I don't know. That um, firefighting bill may not be sexy, but it's still pretty hot, Dirk. Nice. Thank That's you. That's why you're the host. Very nice. Well, Dirk, thanks so much for hanging out with me and uh, I would love to get more info like as things are going. So we might just poke you again, but I know that you're pretty busy once things start rolling. So maybe we won't hear from you until like the next session. I, and like, I, I support people listening to all the podcasts. If folks want like more up-to-date stuff, we do have a podcast at OPB Politics Now that comes out every week. So if I don't get to talk to you again in the short run, like folks can check in on that too, but I'd be happy to come back. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Dirk. Yeah. Nice chatting with you, Claudia. Well, that's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>